Are you a Saskatchewan based Metis entrepreneur looking to start or grow your business? Welcome to Make It Your Business with Victoria Gagne from the Clarence Campo Development Fund, a recognized and successful business resource dedicated to guiding and supporting Metis entrepreneurs on their path to success. With a focus on the Metis community, we share our story and our clients' stories about starting their businesses and how we support them from start to finish. We also deliver innovative financial and professional advice to help you start and run a successful business. Join Victoria and her guests and gain an understanding of the services, programs, and support available for you. This podcast is powered by Proudmouth. Now on to the show. Hello and welcome to Make It Your Business with Victoria Gagne, FCCDF. Victoria, how are you? I'm good, Eric. How are you? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. I, I am... Uh, we're in the middle of winter. I mean, you can't help but be happy because otherwise you're just depressed all the time because it's cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I know that you've got a guest on the show today, and that is Zane Buchanan. And Zane is the founder and creative director behind Civil Creative. Civil Creative is the culmination of many professional and personal experiences Zane experienced over a handful of years. Since graduating from a rural Saskatchewan high school in 2010, Zane has lived, studied, and worked across Canada. Zane moved back to Saskatchewan in 2019, where he was appointed the Saskatchewanderer. I love that name, by the way, the Saskatchewanderer. Uh, this experience laid the groundwork for what is now Civil Creative, a content creation firm that works with diverse organizations to showcase their positive impact on our communities. Zane, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Well, I didn't. It's, it's Victoria. It's all her. She's the boss. Oh. Victoria, why did you bring <laughs> Zane on the show today? Yeah, I'm I'm so excited to have Zane on the show. I think you can hear from the bio that Zane, he is a storyteller. He runs a content creation firm. And I think he's very cognizant of the ways that different life experiences have shaped him in shaped his business, shaped him as an entrepreneur. So I'm excited to have that discussion today and kind of explore the idea of what makes an entrepreneur. And I hope that for everyone listening, it gives them a chance to spark some ideas and reflect on their past experiences and how that could impact their entrepreneurial journey. So Zane, thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very excited to be here. Like not only to be a part of this podcast, but also uh, I'm currently doing a contract in Vancouver where socializing it, it's not a very social city right now. We're kind of in the midst yeah. of another lockdown. So it's just nice to talk to anybody at this point. Absolutely. I was I was starting to talk to my dog a bit. So <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> um, and it's kind of funny because I was thinking about it. And one of the questions we usually like introduce is how did I get introduced to to our guests? And a lot of them are clients. And so the first time I was introduced to them was when they applied to CCDF or reached out or was thinking about starting a business. But with you, it's a little different, actually, because I've followed the Saskatchewan account for quite some time. And when you were appointed Saskatchewan, it was kind of interesting for those of you who don't know what the Saskatchewan is. I know Zane's going to share a little bit about his experiences, but essentially Tourism Saskatchewan, I think it is, appoints someone to be the Saskatchewan for a year and they travel across Saskatchewan and highlight different tourism attractions, different people's stories, whatever it is. And so at the start of each year, they announce the new Saskatchewan and that's how I got introduced to you, Zane. And I think what was really interesting for me is I know that the Saskatchewan had come under some criticism before you had arrived on the scene as being pretty non-diverse, like very white. Yeah. It's something I noticed. And then you posted your first photo and you are Métis, but you're also white passing. So am I. And what I found really interesting is it sparked a conversation right away. And what you did, which I loved, was you just addressed the elephant in the room, the criticism with Saskatchewan, but also your identities as a queer man, as a Métis man, but also as someone who's white passing. So I'm just wondering, like when you get into this role, how did you address the critiques of that program through the work you did over that year? And how did you approach that first conversation? Yeah. So, I mean, I had I, I had moved to Saskatchewan for that role. I was living in Toronto at that point, but I, I very much am born and raised and I'm a, a product of Saskatchewan. 
but I, I will be honest, I wasn't entirely super familiar. I, I had left Saskatchewan in 2010, right after high school, and, and I had just returned in 2019 for the position. And I think 2010 was the year that the, the program could coincidentally was uh, launched. So I, um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't following the account at the point I, I found out about it when a friend kind of forwarded, forwarded me the application info about two weeks before the submission deadline. And they were like, that you'd be really great at this. You should, you should apply. I kind of like that distance that I've always had from it because it, it prevented the pitfalls of, of, of comparisons with my predecessors or, or subconscious replication of efforts. Uh, that said, I did look back at my predecessors and I did notice the pattern. Uh, there was like three white dudes before me. And and given kind of where we were at in that cultural zeitgeist at the time, I, I, I was kind of like, yeah, there's no way that a program of this magnitude with that kind of, I guess, government affiliation would, would hire someone like me. It seemed pretty inevitable that they would go the route of hiring a female or a more visually facing uh, representation of the BIPOC community. That said, I, I did know that I represented a different kind of diversity, being queer, being Métis. It just kind of wasn't immediately seen on a surface level. So I did bring right. it up uh, right away in my application video. And I noticed that I recognized the optics and I'm aware of them. But ultimately, showcasing diversity would be the lens through which I would create content. So circling back to kind of that initial post, though, like, it's interesting. Uh, we live in a society that as a collective, we kind of gravitate, we kind of gravitate towards that that comment section. It's very fun to see the drama yeah. unfold. And I'm guilty of that myself. And uh, the Saskatchewan Wanderer is kind of its own unique beast, because uh, it's a mass following, but it kind of just falls into your lap on an instant. And, right. and it isn't a following that I necessarily earned or or that I had attracted with my own brand or sensibility. It, it, it existed. Yeah. It, it preceded me. So <laughs> there were people that followed for my predecessors. And they were kind of just stuck with me now at this point, even though they might not follow or share my values. So with that, I knew that from the second I posted this introductory post, there would be scrutiny. And I was like, ooh, I'm not going to apologize off the bat for who I am. So I did. I just kind of let it unfold. I, I was like, here's a picture of me, very little copy, very little um, exposition. It was just kind of like, here's my picture. And I knew exactly what was going to come. You got this immediate visual representation of what appears to be like a white cis het man, which obviously raised some ears. And in the days preceding, there was these headlines addressing my sexuality, addressing my indigene indigeneity. And eventually, uh, my application video was released where I was the first one to say, like, hey, Saskatchewan, way ahead of you. I, I, I'm very cognizant of, of what is happening. And, and I just want you guys to know, going forward, if I do get this role, like, the diversity approach would be kind of my utmost priority. Uh, so yes, there were boxes of diversities that had not yet been checked off. And, and I also still recognize the privilege of being a white facing person uh, yeah. that comes with that. That said, there are, I don't think we should discount the importance of, of queer representation in, in Saskatchewan as well as Métis representation. So I did kind of use that opportunity and that scrutiny to, to open up that forum and, and begin that discourse through the comment section uh, surrounding Saskatchewan's views on diversity and inclusion. And I think that that very much, it was the first thing I did as a Saskatchewander and it is kind of the legacy I left. And it's ultimately what laid the groundwork for what is civil creative. And I think that's what I, I love about how I watched you over that year was the elevation of people's voices throughout your journey there and then like you you had a strong your own strong voice within that but I found you really did a great job of elevating other people's voices and that's what I see you know when I read your first business plan when we were going to approve you for CCDF programs right was that idea that fundamental impact of how do I use this business how do I use my platform to elevate diverse voices and now we see that in civil creative which is so cool yeah well i do think like basically all of this happened prior like since i i have with gone i've decided to enroll in many many programs diversity and inclusion workshops more specific nuanced workshops for individual demographics and and disenfranchised groups that said 
uh, those were definitely beneficial for for yeah. increasing kind of my theoretical knowledge. But I do think that the skill set that kind of got me through that process wasn't learned through theory. I think it was very much about breaking down my ego from the get-go and just being mm. responsive and, and listening. And I think that people take for granted just how much you can gain just for, from having open ears and, and listening to what the audience wants and, and trying to work through that with the general community. Absolutely. And that's such an important lesson in business too. Like you mentioned the comment section and how critical that is for businesses too when responding to critiques online that can be very damaging to your business is how do you find those points of connection with people? How do you hear where they're coming from and respond? And I think it's something you, I noticed you do very masterfully in that first post. Like I, I remember it to this day and it's been a couple of years since you've been the Saskatchewan or so kudos well, to you. you. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I know you've, you like through this journey as the Saskatchewan as well, I know you've been introduced to CCDF a couple times throughout yeah. your life, but you were actually able to work with CCDF as the Saskatchewan. And I'm just mm-hmm. wondering how did that interaction with CCDF inform your entrepreneurial journey? But then also, were there other connections you made along the way during that season of your life when you weren't an entrepreneur, you were on contract, that impacted your choice to start a business afterwards? Yeah, I, I mean, it's so cliche to say, like, the connections you make on the journey will ultimately kind of shape your future. And and it's if I was talking to a younger version of myself, I would just be kind of like, don't take any connection for granted, because you never know where that when that will circle back towards you. And and ultimately result in an opportunity. So we will probably, I'm sure I'm expecting, I guess, questions about my family ties to CCDF. I'm sure that that will come up. So CCDF has always been kind of a bit of a staple in my life just because of affiliations of loved ones with, with the organization. But then I guess basically when my partners at Trade and Export Development mentioned the possibility of, of maybe promoting CCDF as a part of the Saskatchewan Wanderer Initiative, that's kind of what pulled me in was, I guess, was my family ties to CCDF and also the Métis ties as well. I, I basically, Trade and Export Development helped fund my mission as a Saskatchewan wanderer and my travels. And and what they focus on is is the development of, of, of small businesses in within the province. So CCDF was kind of a natural conduit there, me being Métis and me also being, I guess, the heir to a business that once that is remains a client of CCDF. So yeah. So for those of you who don't know Zane's parents, and we'll talk about this um, a little later too, but Zane's parents are clients of CCDF as well. They own a great business <laughs> in, in Regina called Zoom Zoom Groom. I'll give a little shout out there. So if you mm-hmm. have a pet that needs grooming, uh, Zoom Zoom Groom is your place to go. <laughs> Yeah, that's the that's the spot. Yeah. So I it was really funny, like a full circle thing when I was presented with the opportunity to work alongside CCDF and create content for them. And then cut to after my like term as the Saskatchewan Wanderer ended, it seemed kind of like a no brainer to approach CCDF to pursue my future endeavors as well. Awesome. And, and were there any other kind of you talked about this great advice that you'd give to your younger self about just recognizing that the relationships you build along the road are important to invest in because you don't know what seeds you're sowing or what's going to come from that. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you have any other examples of that, like along your journey, whether it was in the Saskatchewan or through your education or, or whatever? Yeah. I mean, it is, it's so interesting because I lived such like a, a transient early 20s that I would go to school somewhere and then I would move somewhere else to work. And I was like, oh, that was stupid. I have no connections in this city <laughs> kind of thing. And I would do internships in Vancouver and then be like, oh, I'm going to move to Toronto and try to start a career there kind of thing. Yeah. And me being like, oh, I never planted any seeds here. So it's kind of interesting as an adult or later in my 20s, further into my adulthood, these things are starting to fall into place, which is really, really nice. Through through the Saskatchewan Wanderer, I developed a relationship with with Destination to Canada, who is ultimately our, our federal tourism organization. And through there, I did contracts with 
the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada and LGBT tourism as well. And since I finished the Saskatchewan Wanderer and launched my own business, Civil Creative, pretty much within the month that I launched my business, both ITAC, Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada and Destination Indigenous, as well as as some LGBT campaigns within Destination Canada all reached out to me to work with them. And that never would have happened if I didn't have the exposure of the Saskatchewan Wanderer. And if I didn't work with um, specifically my advisor, Suzanne, who came out to do a LGBT shoot that showcases Saskatoon as as an LGBT friendly destination for travel. And that all kind of like just one weekend, I guess, two years prior, all culminated in pretty much a full workload as as a wow. business owner right now. So it's crazy. And I was like, I always kind of try to think back on that weekend. And um, I remember it was right after Nest Creek Music Festival, which I was profiling. I had no clean clothes. I was living out of my van. And that was like the two days I spent with Suzanne, who somehow, thank God, saw something in me that she thought would lend itself to these future endeavors. But it's really funny to look back on. I think that we did a filming of me doing like a whiskey tasting at a local um, like brewery and i think i got i think i got pretty drunk by accident and stuff (laughs) like that so it's really funny i'm like oh i guess like she saw something in me but although i don't think that that was my my peak performance by any means (laughs) but it it worked out it worked out and now she's a she's a great collaborator and i do most of my projects with her so yeah So then thinking about how there have been people who have influenced your past and how that can influence your future journey, I'm sure there are two pretty significant people in your life who have impacted your your past and your present and your future. We talked about your parents being entrepreneurs, and I'm just wondering, how has their entrepreneurial journey informed how you view entrepreneurship and how you approach entrepreneurship and business? What What lessons have you learned from them? Yeah, I mean, it's so weird. I guess like my parents launched their business, I think I was 13, 14. Or I I say my parents, I mean my mom. This is my mom's pride and joy. Now my dad is very much involved in the process, but it did start as my mom's little love child. That said, I do think it became so ingrained in my life that it did become kind of like a second nature view of, of the industry. And I do think that the way my mom's approach to business is so intertwined with also just her way of existing, I guess. Like her approach to business is very much her approach to everything. So although Zoom Zoom Groom, yeah, it's a joint effort of my mom and my dad. It's very much my mom's a result of my mom's kind of brilliant insanity, I guess I would say. Uh, I, I kind of that. always, yeah, <laughs> I kind of always say that on the spectrum of sane and insane, I would say my mom's approach to business kind of sits right where the magic happens. Um, (laughs) That is so good. I always say that too, where it's like there's this fine line between like insanity and genius and you never know which side of the line a genius sits on. (laughs) Exactly. And I would say that anyone who meets my mom would like kind of immediately understand that sentiment of uh, she's definitely like not I won't say that she's an unstable kooky person no, I will say no, that was, absolutely, absolutely not. not I will say that she I think it's like an outlook thing I think all of her her entrepreneurial results uh, pursuits are kind of the result of, of such a fantastical perspective of the world and, and not only having the confidence in herself as an entrepreneur but also the confidence in her community that they will receive her work with that same positivity And then kind of enter Randy, who is my dad, who is there to kind of harness that creativity and that tenacity and look at it from more of an um, analytical approach and develop Mm. kind of an execution strategy. Also, people like CCDF who come in and and help take this this beautiful insanity and lay it out in a way that it is tangible. And uh, so growing up watching all of this, I kind of had the privilege of of taking elements from both entrepreneurial mindsets, the creative the creative side, and then the analytical side of my mom and my dad. And I would say that kind of every incredible opportunity that I have gotten has been a result of kind of a manic, uh, shot in the dark approach, which is very, very much a product of my mom's upbringing. And, and then also from there, I maintain these professional relationships with the kind of 
grounded logistical approach that my dad has. So like, for example, like the Saskatchewan application, it was kind of such a far-fetched thing. I was just like, oh, I'm going to send in a video and then hopefully get a car and get paid to drive around Saskatchewan and make content for a year. And I kind of just look, looked at it the way that my mom kind of would look at things and, and just did an impulsive application threw all of myself into it. And then I kind of decided I would deal with the thought of relocating across the country later. And then right after that contract, uh, a good friend of mine in Toronto told me that Jesse Cruikshank, who was this MTV star, hosted a TV show with Dan Levy all throughout my youth. Uh, I, I was obsessed with her as a kid. She was looking for a content producer for her digital brand. And for whatever reason, she was looking for someone funny as well as like had all the credentials to produce this uh, level of content. So for whatever reason, I thought that my sense of humor wouldn't be conveyed through a typical cover letter scenario. So I, I had this other kind of Connie inspired, like <laughs> manic uh, impulse and I just kind of filmed myself a video of me telling her why I would be perfect for this position and kind of being a ham and laying in a bunch of jokes yeah and I just sent it to her Instagram DMs and somehow landed that job which I still do as a side hustle to this day and that's very much kind of a, a Connie move which you wouldn't think as like being a important asset to to being an entrepreneur but I think that it's kind of important to harness that for lack of a better word, insanity. And that is very necessary to launching a business of that magnitude. And I think that, that I am so lucky to have gained that from my mom, as well as the um, logistical approach that my dad has. Absolutely. I think it's, they've got such a good balance. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting that you've gotten to like witness that growing up. And yeah, it's, it's for those of you who have never been Zoom Zoom Grooms an incredible business is incredible operation. And so to be able to witness that and then pull those experiences from how you've seen your parents interact, you know, we're the sum of our ancestors, we're the sum of our parents mm -hmm. um, and thinking about just those experiences, like what foundations have your ancestors, your parents, your grandparents laid for you in your journey and whatever that is in life, I think for, for anyone listening is an important question to ask ourselves because sometimes we don't get the chance to reflect on that. Well, and like for context, my mom was a teacher for 20 years. She taught at the school board that I attended. And then when she was 13, she decided, I guess, uh, she had gained all she can from that industry and decided to buy a van, convert it into a dog grooming salon and drive it to people's yards and driveways and groom their dogs in a mobile dog grooming unit. That's how the business Zoom Zoom Groom started, which in retrospect is the most insane thing in the world. Like when I tell but people brilliant. that. <laughs> but brilliant, but yeah. brilliant. And it, and it resulted in something huge, huge and amazing. But I yeah. do think... Like it took such vulnerability, such such bravery at that time to do that. And I do think that that is half the battle is just kind of having that chutzpah to, hmm. to make something like that happen. And I think that that is such a, a gift that my mom has passed along to me. That's awesome. So I think to to kind of wrap this up, we're going to ask you a couple quick questions. And For I sure. apologize because I'm giving you an impossible task because they're a bit loaded. But... We're going to see what we can do here. <laughs> I'll do my best to not like talk for five hours the way that I love to. <laughs> no problem. I love this. There's like, there's so much in here that I hope people are hearing and thinking and reflecting back on their own journeys and what's informed them, um, especially mm -hmm. if they've had thoughts of entrepreneurship, but also just in life in general, like as you're, as you're creating a life for yourself, these are important questions to ask is like, what mm -hmm. makes you, you, um, but to close out this conversation on what makes an entrepreneur, I think it's necessary to ask the question, why was it necessary to start civil creative? Like there's a lot of people who are, who don't feel the call to entrepreneurship or owning their own business. So why was it necessary to start something? It happened during like the craziest time that hopefully we'll experience in the duration of our lives. There was a pandemic, there was a uprise of, of racially motivated discourse. So I mean, like, it goes without saying that there is fulfillment that comes with 
philanthropic efforts and I, I very much experienced that as a Saskatchewander and that was what exposed me to that industry. Uh, that said, like my starting civil creative wasn't just me being an altruist, like I did see economic value in, in these services. I would love to say that I, I'm completely just a charitable human, but no, I did think that there was room for this kind of work in the industry. Uh, I started civil creative at the beginning of the pandemic, which is also just like me trying to harness my own I guess, like authority within my career, because there was no security to, to be found for creators at the time. And then it was also at the beginning of the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and all kinds of discourse surrounding discrimination. And there was still lingering discourse surrounding the meme, the Me Too movement, all kinds of stuff. It was just kind of a different lens through which everyone had started to see the world. And you can open up social media without these different organizations and prominent figures being taken down for their acts of, of ignorance. And although many of these accounts did have condemnable behavior that warranted the scrutiny, uh, some just didn't have the tools and knowledge or or experience to speak about such nuanced subject matter at the time. Right. And it was a time when they were forced to speak on it. Exactly, exactly. And I feel like, although that critical lens through which everyone was looking was very valuable, yeah, I could absolutely. see it being super, super daunting to people that, that mean well. They just don't have the vernacular to speak about these things uh, at the mm -hmm. time. It doesn't go to say that they were putting in the effort to eventually develop that way of speaking. It just, it, it didn't exist at the time. And at that time, I started getting messages from people because I was taking time off after the Saskatchewan Wanderer. I had to go deal with my apartment in Toronto. And basically, at the time that I was ready to re-enter the workforce, it was March 2020 when right. the world was crumbling. So I had time and people were messaging me and they noticed my efforts as a Saskatchewan Wanderer. And they were ultimately asking me to consult and vet their content to make sure that it, it would be received in a, in a positive light. And at that point, I, that's when I noticed these gaps in our communication as a society. And I noticed that I had this inherent skill set that, like I said, just came with, with the dismantling of my ego and, and open ears and receptiveness yeah. to learning new things. And that came with the very specific experience that I ha had in the realm of marketing. And I started to notice that there was such great value in, in what I had to offer to many clients. So it just was kind of like the perfect opportunity to launch my business. And then right away, like I, I knew that indigenous tourism always had their eyes on me since the Saskatchewan Wanderer and, and LGBT tourism, Nations Magazine, all of these groups. I knew I wanted to build a business that would accommodate me working with those clients who I loved hmm. working with. So that kind of is what, and then I think it was another one of those Connie impulse moments before I even kind of wrap my head around it. I had messaged you, Victoria, being like, yo, if this is something I want to do, can you help me make this happen? And, yeah. and that kind of is what held me accountable for seeing it through. Oh, I love it. You, you essentially, you saw an opportunity and then you crafted your dream job from it which is yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, I do think it's kind of in retrospect, it's interesting, it's so cliche to say, but I'm like, thank goodness in my personal life, the pandemic had such a, a positive impact on me and, and the time to reflect. And ultimately, none of my current professional endeavors, which I value so much, would exist without that time and that space to right. to develop this this idea absolutely and you know i say it's a, a dream job but i'm sure there's been challenges along the way do you have <laughs> like a quick um i'm sure there's been many but do you have a quick experience of like one challenge you've experienced and how well, you overcame it absolutely like honestly in the grand scheme of things i'm lucky to have not faced more like carnage like i know i'm working in in an industry that is very delicate and I, I'm very mm -hmm. aware of that. And I'm surprised that I haven't faced more public scrutiny, especially working with these huge national brands. The day I was hired on with Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada, 
was literally the day of the first residential school findings. And so basically I was scheduled to do all my training that day for a position that hadn't exist before me. They developed it for me. And that was all thrown out the window because we just had to kind of put people were relying on us to provide resources to a nationwide strategy. So I just kind of got thrown into the mix. It was such a humbling experience, but it was very, very, very terrifying because the stakes were so high. People were so distraught and rightfully so given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. So the timing of that was very, very difficult. But it's one of those things where I got thrown to the wolves at the beginning and everything has seemed significantly easier since so i kind of ripped off that band-aid but it was it did it was very humbling experience it made me reflect i kind of had an imposter syndrome at that time but yeah and also going in and working with an all indigenous team and being very white facing a big challenge has been a, a being able to own my own indigeneity and i i think that that came with a territory and was it's been a great growth experience for me as an indigenous person and then there's the logistical things like i would say I got maybe 75% of my mom's genes and 25% of my dad's genes. So when it comes to like logistics, accounting, yeah. this and that, like, oh, that's such a uphill battle for me that I, I'm slowly growing in that area. I think the first staff I hire will be an administrator accountant that can handle all of the left brain activity. But I, um, I'm learning, I'm growing. I think that I'm just getting easy with myself and, and, I mean, and accessing I, I, the supports available to you, right? <laughs> exactly. Thank goodness to the folks at CCDF. They have provided me so much amazing support in the areas that I do feel weakest. The, it's another thing too. I get so excited. I take on more clients than I I can actually handle at a given right. time. And I think that that will be something that I need to wrap my head around as I go because I get so excited when people come to me despite yeah. kind of the room and space I have to accommodate their their contracts, I'll just be like, of course, like I'll do whatever it takes to make this work. And I do, it does like the product is never compromised, yeah. but I think eventually I need to start thinking about my own capacity mental health as or, well yeah, and my yeah. capacity. So, so those are all kind of learning curves. Like, I mean, civil creative has existed for like just under a year. So, yeah. I mean, there's much, it's all there's a lot of time. Pains. There's a lot of time to grow. It is exciting. It's scary. Yeah. I, I do think I'm going to be expanding, hopefully, in the near future to the point that it's not just me handling and wearing many hats. But yeah, I mean, I think that I've been very lucky that given all of these setbacks and these difficulties, they're all a result of, of people's interest and their their support of my business. So you have to look at it through that lens and just be grateful. Awesome. And, and speaking of support of your business... What is the success you've experienced that we can celebrate with you right now? Ooh. It's a chance to shout yourself out. Shameless. I mean, uh, actually, just at the top of my head, it's so great. As someone that studied journalism and kind of went the route of marketing for um, financial reasons, it's yeah. really great. I'm going full circle, and I just did my first editor-in-chief job for Nations Magazine, which is an Indigenous lifestyle magazine. And it does go live uh, at the beginning of March. So it's just getting translated right now, which is really exciting, both French and English. And uh, that will be viewable. It will be on all WestJet flights at the beginning of March, pending, I guess, sanitary COVID yes. uh, stuff. But then it will also be a digital copy will be at destinationindigenous.ca. So you can look at that. It is so beautiful. I... I I'm so excited. I Most of my stuff I do is produced digitally and having something in my hands gives yeah. me such joy. Just like a kind of nicely curated book. It, it, it's such a simple pleasure for me. Yeah, I, I mean, there's so many great things that are happening that are in the works that I don't know if I have the... Uh, yeah go ahead to speak about just yet but okay um, well then where can people find you or connect so okay. that you know when these things come about they can uh see what's absolutely. going on absolutely so uh civilcreative.com is my website you can also follow me on instagram civil creative and then also uh, if you want to email me i am zane z-a-n-e at civilcreative.com 
And I just want to let everyone know that um, we've mentioned some supports available, but CCDF does have management skills and business support programs for Métis entrepreneurs. So if you've listened to this and think Zane would actually be a good fit to work with in terms of helping you with your communication strategy or whatever that looks like, please reach out to CCDF. We can put you in touch with Zane and then we can also put you in touch with some resources to assist you in working with him. So Zane, kind of sum up in like a couple sentences. What's your ideal client? Ah, it it gives me genuine enjoyment to to work and collaborate with those who, who love what they do. And I guess that that's why I pursued this route. I, I feel like if you are starting a business, then you're probably very, very passionate about something. So I like to just harness that energy and work together in a collaborative effort to, to broadcast it to a broad audience and ultimately create a community from there. That sounds great. I know you have a lot of contracts, but maybe there's an entrepreneur out there that's a, a great fit and um, absolutely we can get you absolutely. connected. But thank you so much for just sharing your story with us, your life experiences. I, I really appreciate you like holding that space for this conversation and hopefully sparking that conversation, like I said to you listeners, on what what makes an entrepreneur. And I think what we've learned is that that answer is very individual but we can all think about those experiences that have led us on the journey we're on and and think about how they can inform where we want to go so thank you so much for opening up that conversation with us today zane of course thanks so much for hanging out i'll tell you what zane and victoria you guys are the perfect pair for this podcast at this point because your both your energy and your positivity are absolutely palpable and catching right i mean I, I love that I, i'm hoping that the the audience is energized by everything that you said zane in the future i'm looking forward to a memoirs book of all your adventures because you got a lot of stuff man that's great yeah. so a lot, a lot of stories so thank you so much Thanks. for sharing that today victoria of course thank you so much for bringing zane on today and our last thank you goes to you the listening audience thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the make it your business podcast with victoria gagne If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way when Victoria comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at CCDF, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Make It Your Business the podcast that identifies market opportunities and provides Saskatchewan-based Métis entrepreneurs with innovative financing and business advice. Have questions about topics covered during the show? Visit www.clarencecampo.com, email us at info at clarencecampo.com, or give us a call at 306-657-4870. Don't forget to click the follow button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the hosts and or guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Clarence Campo Development Fund. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor, accountant, or other qualified business service providers with any questions you may have regarding your individual situation.